Welcome back to another episode of the Hormone Hub podcast, where we talk all things perimenopause, menopause, and have the conversations no one else is having. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Hormone Hub. In today's episode, we are very lucky to have Dr. Peter Wright with us. Peter is a gynecologist, a paediatric and adolescent gynecologist, which I think is amazing because I've not come across that before, and also a fertility specialist. She's the author of Healing Pelvic Pain and also one of the owners of Vera Women's Wellness in Brisbane. So Dr. Wright is committed deeply to all aspects of women's health care and, you know, founded the Vera Women's Wellness Clinic in 2020. She strives to take a holistic approach to managing the health concerns of women of all ages. Um, she's also very highly tuned to the ways that nutrition, stress and lifestyle can affect hormonal imbalance hormonal balance and aims to help women work on these aspects of their lives as part of their overall health picture. So for those listeners who've been with me for a long time, we are definitely on the same page. And I first heard Dr. Peter speak at the Metagenics Women's Wellness Symposium, which was amazing. So, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot from what we have to talk about today. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, no, my pleasure. So obviously for you to get into sort of gynecological health, was there any sort of pathway that sort of triggered you to to, to go down that route? Um, I always wanted to be a doctor. I just always remember wanting to help people from the moment I would be like sewing up my dolls um, when I was a child. And then when I did medicine, I sort of, I probably fell in love with, uh, I got into gynecology through delivering babies. So that that being very privileged to be involved in that incredibly vulnerable, beautiful time in um, women's lives when they give birth to their babies or when they're pregnant with their babies, that was the draw card for me, getting me into gynecology to begin with. Yeah. Um, and then over the years, when I when I got into private practice, actually, after I had my own baby and I sort of stepped back from obstetrics a little bit more, I realised kind of potentially how badly we'd all been doing gynaecology for a really long time, including me, and how it was often that women's problems were seen as, or women's, women's problems really, were seen as just to do with the uterus or the vagina or the vulva. And they kind of, the, the conventional Western approach would be often to not take any account, uh, any consideration into the rest of a woman's body, her nervous system, her brain, her environment, her culture. And as I started to see more and more women, I found that I was it was impossible for me to see someone for, you know, half an hour or 15 minutes and just deal with the, the like the gynecological issue that came because it, it became very very clear to me that everything was connected and that if we just dealt with a symptom in you know often the very biomedical way I was taught it's like a bit like playing whack-a-mole and you're not really ever getting to the root of the problem and so I spent a lot of time listening to the to my clients and then realizing all the stuff I didn't know and that I had to learn. And so I did some extra training in nutrition and then in integrative women's health through a really amazing practitioner in the US called Dr. Aviva Rom, who's wonderful, who was a midwife and a herbalist before she became a doctor. Mm. And then after that, I kind of didn't see things the same way and I couldn't go back to practicing the way I practiced. And then I found like there's so much beauty to be uncovered in women's lives and women's bodies that I feel have been kind of taken from us or taken from them. And so I kind of think a lot of what I do now is not giving anything to women but really uncovering what's been there all along and helping them to remember 
the wisdom that their body holds that I think our culture sort of conditions us or them to forget. And I think that actually contributes to so many of the problems that women are presenting with. And it's just like gynecology as a field, it just is like very much pathologizing women's bodies. And of course, there are definitely conditions that are really need, you know, surgery and intervention and medication. But I think for the vast majority of, of things, it's often the effects of of lifestyle and environment and culture that actually it's not the woman's bodies at all. It's the effect of, the, of, of those things on the woman's body. So I think we, we have to remember that when we're treating women. But yeah, and now I love I love what I do, but I make sure that I have the time allocated to to listen to women and be able to hear their stories and put all the pieces together so we can get to the to the root of the problem. Yeah, yeah, I love that so much. And and I think that's going to be music to so many women's ears because they are treated as symptoms. Or they, you know, oh, you are endometriosis, you are bad periods, or you know, whatever it is. And I love the fact that you're you're listening to them and having the conversation. And I say to women all the time, because they're sort of like, well, what blood test do I need for my hormones? Mm. And I'm like, well, you don't actually need a blood test because that gives us a snapshot of what's happening in the moment. Mm-hmm. How about you tell me what's going on? And you do, you get so much more from that conversation because you get the whole picture of what's going on. And the thing that I find really sad is so many women who have debilitating gynecological issues and we're to the point where they need to take a couple of days off work each month because they're in pain or they're experiencing flooding and things like that. And that is their normal their sister is the same, their mother's the same, their auntie was were the same. So that's just normal for them and they just deal with it. And that sort of blew my mind because I've always been, I guess, blessed with a healthy cycle where my period just arrives. I might bleed for sort of five days and then it goes and it's sort of no real issues. So until I went down this pathway, I had no idea of of what a lot of women just put up with, um, which really shocked me. And it still shocks me. I think every single conversation I have, I'm I'm constantly blown away with with what women are coping with on a daily basis. Mm. Yeah, I think women definitely... There's that thing of being told that something's normal and that they just need to put up with it. But then there's also this kind of, like, I I always hate it when, and I think that any symptom that a woman has that is interfering with the life that she wants to lead needs to be addressed. Yes. Sure, because there's so many things we can do and that they have options. But I also think that we live in a culture where, women are supposed to pretend that they don't actually have a uterus or ovaries and we have to pretend that that cycle doesn't happen every month. We have to pretend that, like the number of times I have had women say, oh, my hormones are up and down. And like, yes, your hormones are up and down. They're supposed to be up and down. It's meant to be, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the society that doesn't accommodate for that or yeah. educate. And so then women think they're terribly, drastically abnormal. And with periods, it is an event where our energy is lower. We, most people do have some pain. It's an inflammatory event in the body. While I don't think that being bed bound and suffering is normal and should always be investigated, I do think that we have a tendency in our society to make zero room for the, that event every month, which I actually think contributes to the pressure and the suffering that women feel because they feel so guilty yes. that exactly the same every minute of the, their, their month, even when they're bleeding and even when they're having some cramps, that I actually think that if there was allowances and room for the 50% of the population that has a period to give themselves more time and space and nurturing during that time and for that to be acceptable, yes. I think there would be a lot less suffering and a lot less pathology. Yeah, and also the other thing is to that, like women suffering with things they don't need to, but also women feeling like they don't have a choice. I saw a lady the other day who'd had endo, but but had been not given any choices for her treatment of endometriosis. And so had had surgeries, had was on, you know, two different kinds of hormonal medications, which since then she'd put on 
like quite a lot of weight, like 20 kilos or something. And then she actually started Ozempic to combat the effects of the drugs that she was on when she didn't probably need to be on those drugs to begin with. But And when I talked to her about this, she was like, I could tell she was totally baffled and confused because it wasn't the advice she had. She yeah. said to me, the follow-up appointment, I didn't realise I had to, got to choose what yeah. treatments were right for me. Yeah, yeah. It was like the it's the thing of treating the condition, treating the diagnosis or the label of the thing that you've got, but not taking into account that there's a human being at the centre of that and so that the treatment often becomes worse than the disease you're trying to treat. Yeah. Yeah. And women do feel more broken. Yeah, you know? yeah. And that's it. And then you've got that whole, you've got anxiety that kicks in, the yes. whole self-worth and that self-esteem of that that woman sort of drags everything down as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So what sort of symptoms do you tend to see? What are clients coming to see you with typically in perimenopause? Um, I would say that they might come to see me with hot flushes, vaginal dryness, lower libido, lower energy, brain fog, word finding difficulties like we were discussing earlier, lack of sleep, so insomnia, more anxiety, more irritability, all of those kinds of problems. I don't know if I said weight gain. And then so I get people with some symptoms and then sometimes I get people who are just anxious about the perimenopause transition so I get people coming and going am I I'm 47 am I in perimenopause like it's the worst thing in the world and it's a diagnosis in itself so I think again while it's wonderful that we're actually talking openly about this time in our lives women understand what's happening to them and they can put words to it and that those words can then help to explain the things that are happening and then lead to a plan if they need a plan and options. I also think there's there's still that this tendency to pathologize even this part of a woman's body at like lifespan. Yeah. It is a natural and normal part of our life. Yes. Our life. And I think that that sometimes the medicalization of that drives me a bit crazy too. And so, so that then women just thinking, oh my God, it's I've got this looming diagnosis of like yes. menopause. Yes. <laughs> it's, not, okay. it's not an illness <laughs> right what can I do to stop it from happening <laughs> not a lot <laughs> no but then I think it then speaks to the fact that there are there are symptoms of our changing hormones yep. and then so it, it this coincides with the time of our lives that is it's that time where like we get tapped on the shoulder and get told this is not a dress rehearsal this is the real deal what are you doing and there's that spiritual opportunity for spiritual growth and transformation that I think that many women don't get that and I think if women could understand that it's this also this opportunity for for spiritual transformation and growth as we enter this next part of our life that would be a really beautiful thing because there's a lot of beauty in that and I think Mm -hmm. when you look at other cultures they do it's very revered that whole menopause transition and they sort of become the the wise matriarch Um, yeah whereas yeah I mean I was reading an American article not that in in America they're still referring to menopausal women as crones and I'm like surely you can come up with a better word than that (laughs) I know and it's also like everything's I mean, there's so much misogyny in medicine in general, but, you know, where men are still the standard. But in with, I also find like women who, oh, I've got this lower libido and I'm like, you know, 55 and my hormones have dropped off a cliff. You're like, well, yes, because you're no longer wanting to reproduce and like that's hormonally the reality. Plus there's like often a long-term relationship, often women are stressed out of their mind. There's a lot of valid reasons. They're exhausted, yeah. yeah. But there's this idea, again, that it's abnormal and because we're measuring libido as somehow like the perfect libido is like when you're 25 and you've just met someone you're crazy about. Yeah. Um, and like if it's not that, then there's something wrong with you as well. Like that is, so I, I just think really like with women who come to see me at perimenopause concerned, on one hand, 
like a lot of the things that happen post perimenopause, post menopause, I should say, because obviously perimenopause is like such a buzzy word, but it just means the time around yes. menopause. And menopause is just that time when our hormones stop being made from our ovaries. And after menopause, you know, you read all those, all the bad things that can happen, osteoporosis and heart disease and diabetes and dementia and, and you know, everything dries up and it's horrible. And, and I think that oh, they're actually, you know, that's ageing, right? And because our culture is so unbelievably obsessed with clinging on to that, like, youth, it's very, very scary, but I think that we need to keep into keep to understand that we can still be healthy, vibrant people through menopause, and it's just a really great opportunity to like check in what's working for me, do a full health check. What do I need to to optimize in terms of diet and exercise and sleep and stress? Often is a huge thing, yeah. and you no know, hormones can play a role in that. We're using hormone therapy, but so can herbs and supplements and a whole lot of other things and it's not doom and gloom at all no not by any means and then if we sort of circle back to sort of pelvic pain a lot of women sort of become aware for the first time maybe that they have endometriosis a lot of uh, women in our community have recently had adenomyosis diagnoses Mm -hmm. so what what, what sort of, I guess, pathways are available for women with who are suffering pelvic pain? So I think, first of all, it's important to say, I'll just talk about adenomyosis for a moment. Yeah. Because adenomyosis, which is the presence of endometrial cells or the lining cells of the womb that are growing in the muscular layer or the wall of the uterus. Yeah. And something that's actually pretty common in older women, in menopausal women, and we see it much more commonly now because our imaging sensitivity is so much better than it used to be. So we're probably picking up adenomyosis that 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 may not be clinically relevant a lot of the time either. So, yeah. And I think one of those things that often can be as a result of sort of the wear and tear of menstruation, of a lifetime of menstruation. So it's I don't believe that it's pathological all of the time, just like endometriosis, I don't believe is pathological all of the time. And there are many who have have features of adenomyosis on an ultrasound, which they might have had, and don't have particular problems. And then I've seen women who have gotten really worried, oh my God, this is a thing that I've got. And I think that in the absence of any symptoms, it's nothing you need to worry about whatsoever. Yep. It's probably just a result of that wear and tear. Probably more likely if you've had cesarean sections, if you've had like curettes and things like that. It can be associated with heavy bleeding and with more painful periods. And often at perimenopause, one of the things that women can present with or part of the what happens with the hormonal picture of less progesterone and less regular ovulation is that women start to have more heavy periods because of that. And they might get an ultrasound and they may say there's adenomyosis, which may or may not be contributing to the heavy periods because it might be hormonal, it might be adenomyosis, it might be a combination of things. And in that case, I would be simply treating the problem that they have got, like the heavy bleeding with pain. So I wouldn't be fixated on the adenomyosis if yeah. you're in a causal time. So if you have periods, looking at, again, all of the dietary stuff, Looking at treatments that might be non-hormonal, like tranexamic acid, which is a medication that's non-hormonal that can be really helpful for women at this time yes. who might not to have hormones, making sure iron's okay and taking an iron supplement, sometimes using some progesterone, so using natural progesterone. Yes. And then if, if that helps, that's great. It works obviously to give the lining a bit more progesterone and thin it out. And it also can help with adenomyosis because progesterone is inhibitory to those endometrial and adenomyosis cells. It might look like using a Mirena, so a progestin-containing intrauterine device, which is probably one of the best ways if you're not winning with the other things that can really help. Um, It's not something that you need to, like, measure again and again or anything like that. So I would be treating the things that it, that it's causing. I have seen, like, for example, I'm thinking about a woman who had a random bit of pelvic pain that came and then went and she never had it again, but she had a scan by her GP 
the GP said, you've got adenomyosis. She got referred to a gynecologist. She had no symptoms otherwise at all, no heavy bleeding, no painful periods. The gynecologist did a laparoscopy and had put two myrenas in this woman who had no problems before and then came to see me because she since developed yeah. cramping pain and all, a lot of hormonal side effects. Yeah. And felt, she felt like, my God, what do you mean I didn't have to have this? Again, it's a, it's a lesson in treating the human and not the thing. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Just because she ticks a box on paper doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that it's not symptom, therefore treatment. Correct. Yeah. And with endometriosis in midlife as well, so in our 40s, yep. 50s. So endometriosis is, again, something that we think of like a homogenous, well, it's all the same thing, but it's not. Again, so most endometriosis is superficial, so like 80% would be superficial. Endometriosis is the cells that usually line the uterus that grow in the pelvis, so in all kinds of places, so on the bowel, on the, on the ovaries, on the bladder. And, again, I think a lot of endometriosis is probably due to, again, a physiological process, the mild endometriosis that we, we see a lot of when we have a period, not 100% of the time, some of that blood comes out through our fallopian tubes and those, those cells land in our pelvis and our immune system should clean those up. If our immune system is overactive or dysfunctional, it can not do such a good job and we can get a lot more inflammation instead of it just being cleared up. But a lot of that superficial endometriosis can probably be as a result of that wear and tear and it comes and goes and we know by studies that when they've looked at inside the pelvises of women who have been found to have endo if they look again in six months time not having done anything to it whatsoever some studies show up to 44 percent has completely resolved by itself yeah. so it goes so it is a it is a dynamic thing in our bodies just like if we have a cut our immune system will do a good job yeah. some women more severe forms of endometriosis like ovarian endometriosis or ovarian endomet they're called ovarian endometriomas so it's big cysts of endometriosis and they can like stick to things and cause more pain although again some women have that and have no pain some women have the mild endometriosis and have no pain probably up to about 40 percent again and then there's a and that's about 15 percent with your ovarian endometriosis and then and that can be diagnosed on ultrasound. And then deep endometriosis, which is probably the most severe, where we get lots of scarring, lots of think organs sticking together, lots of inflammation. That probably accounts for about 5% of women with endometriosis, so much lower percent, and probably has a lot to do with immune system dysfunction. Yes. As well. So for women who are in their 40s and 50s who might be presenting with pain, again, I would be looking at all the potential causes for pain. So, yes, endometriosis can be one of them, but so can so the regular inflammation of the period. If you're having a big heavy bleed, is there you're releasing a lot more prostaglandins or inflammatory prostaglandins, so you can look at reducing inflammation in the body through diet, through supplements like zinc, magnesium, omega-3s, vitamin D if that's low as well to help to support the immune system, looking at diet, so an anti-inflammatory Mediterranean-style diet, lots of fibre, lots of good fats, looking at the nervous system, so what's happening in terms of stress in this woman's life, looking at the brain, is there like an, any element of pain system hyper? hypersensitivity where the volume knob of pain gets turned up and that can often be related to stress and trauma what's happening with the pelvic floor muscles as well because often that is a big source of pain so especially with women when we're stressed we or if we have pain in our pelvis we um, contract our pelvic floor muscles but we're often not aware of it we often don't have a good connection to our pelvic floor and that ongoing over time tension can lead to pelvic floor muscle spasm and that can lead to more pain as well. So I would be looking at all of those things. Yes. A really good quality ultrasound scan, like a proper like tertiary level scan. If it was normal, if it showed everything was mobile and lovely, then I'd be really reassured that if there was anything, it's just going to be superficial endo. If there is an ovarian endometrioma or a deep lesion, they are probably the ones that are the most likely to respond to surgical intervention. Um, but, again, it doesn't need to be surgery if that's not what the 
human in front of you once. There are a whole lot of other things that we can do to to treat pain, and I think that's the, the important thing, especially if fertility isn't a consideration. Yeah, yeah. So, ladies, if you're listening, you have choices, mm-hmm. and I think that's really important, and just that diet, nutrition, self-care, stress management – is so important for so on so many levels, but it really just comes back to every single time is those those basic, you know, and I think the way we feed ourselves is the most basic form of self-care. You know, it just keeps coming back every single time to, you know, to those those key things. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Now, Vera Women's Wellness, whereabouts is your clinic? Like if somebody wanted to reach out, where's the best place? Actually, I'll put the link to your clinic in the show notes. But yeah, just if you could tell us where your clinic is. So we are just outside of Brisbane. So we're about 40 minutes outside of Brisbane. We're in the Samford Valley or Mount Samson. So we're, it's a really beautiful spot. We're intentionally here because, again, I was seeing so many women who were so rushed and stressed and seeing the gynecologist in their lunch hour, not even being able to take time out for that health appointment. Yeah. Um, so it creates space for you to actually be forced to take some space in your life to come here and it's beautiful and natural surroundings. We have lots of different practitioners here, which is wonderful. Yeah, so that's where we are on our website. You'll you'll put on the in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. And you also have a summit coming up. So the Vera Women's Wellness Wisdom Summit on the 28th and 29th of October, which sounds amazing. So, yeah, do you want to share a little bit about that? Yes, so it is not as unlike any other medical conference you've ever been to, but if you're any a women's health practitioner in any way, shape or form, or if you're someone who's just really interested in women's health, it's two days on a weekend, 28th and 29th of October, and we have a big session on pelvic pain in the morning with a great panel. We have workshops on embodiment, on like somatic psychotherapy. We have Dr. Oscar Serilak speaking about the neurobiology of the maternal brain and matrescence. We have a beautiful, our beautiful dietitian talking about intuitive eating and diet and the nervous system. And we have a great gastroenterologist, Dr. Pran Yuganathan, talking about food industry and the gut, as well as two sessions on menopause, one by one of our beautiful gynecologists talking about perimenopause. I think it's called the magic of perimenopause. And (laughs) our yoga teacher, Sam Lindsay German, speaking about menopause is a spiritual transition as well which is so often not spoken about so I'm so excited for that too oh that sounds perfect unfortunately I'm going to be away that weekend but yeah if there's I'll be keeping my eye out for the next one it's something that I would love to to come and be be a part of because I think it's just so important to be having those conversations and letting women know that you do have choices it doesn't have to be this big hard horrible thing it can it's a natural transition we're all going through it and you know we can embrace it and and enjoy it too because yeah it can be quite empowering now you also have a book as well which I wanted to mention so healing pelvic pain so where is the book available if anyone's looking for it the book is on Amazon Booktopia any online bookshops and most in-person bookshops so like yeah most bookshops big W all of those things in person but online at all of the usual places you buy books amazing because I'm going looking for that and congratulations on being a published author as well that's very exciting (laughs) thank you I just I had too many thoughts about things and I just thought it was better to get it down and then hopefully to be able to provide knowledge which can empower women so that they have those choices and then they I just am so passionate about knowledge and empowerment because putting the tools back in the hands of women is really important amazing I think that's fabulous Well, Dr. Peter Wright, thank you so much for being on the Hormone Hub. It has been, I've really enjoyed our conversation. So I, and I do appreciate, I know you, you're a very busy woman and I do appreciate you giving up your time yeah, to come and be a guest on the show. Thank you very much. My favourite thing is talking to women about their bodies. So it's my pleasure. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And yeah, we will see you in the next episode. 
Thank you for taking the time to listen today. You can head on over to the show notes at kyliepinwill.com slash podcast where you'll find all the links. Now, before we go, it would mean the world to me if you'd head on over to your favorite podcast channel, subscribe and leave a review. Don't forget to share it with your friends. Then stay tuned for next week's episode and I can't wait to see you then.